Hello and welcome to our introduction to Psych 105, Individual and Social Behavior. So this is an online course and I wanted to give us a little bit of an introduction to your instructor, me, as well as to the course itself, just so that you know what to expect and where to get started when you're starting this class. So first things first, who is this random person talking at you in this video and who will be talking at you in all of the videos for the rest of the semester? Uh, hi, I am Dr. Kimberly Campbell. You can call me Dr. Campbell. You can call me Kimberly. Both are perfectly acceptable. I do use Kimberly Campbell because there is another Kim Campbell on campus uh, and she's a little bit more famous than me. Uh, so I always use my full first name. Um, so to get started, I always like to explain first off, why the heck do instructors uh, sit down on the first day and show you their backgrounds? Seems kind of weird to have this list of your academic accomplishments. However, the way that I like to do this is this is me showing you why I am a reliable source of information for this course. As scientists, we are taught to be critical of the information that we take in, to vet our sources, to make sure that they are trustworthy. And so me telling you about my background, um, my education and my research, this is me showing you my experience and telling you why I'm a valid source of information for this course. So very, very briefly, um, I got a Bachelor of Science uh, with honors and co-op in uh, uh, biology of all things. I'm not actually a psychologist to begin with. Um, I did my undergraduate research in biology, specifically focusing in on things like genetics and evolution. Um, though, as part of my co-op placements, I got to work at an animal rehab center, which introduced me to uh, working with corvids, which are very, very intelligent creatures, and it got me asking questions about personality in birds. And of course, when I started looking at doing research, uh, and specifically going on and continuing my education with research, um, people were telling me that that's not really a biology question. It was far more of a psychology question. Question. And so I came out here to the University of Alberta and I got both a master's and a PhD in psychology looking at birds. Not so much personality in birds, but I do end up studying learning and communication in black cap chickadees. And this is actually really useful for this class because my methods of, dis uh, sort of discovering how they learn and different aspects of their communication uh, involves operant conditioning, which ends up playing a huge role in this class. So you guys will actually get to learn quite a bit about my research because I'm able to use it as examples when we start getting towards those topics in this course. Um, as an aside, I also did my undergraduate research. I was sequencing DNA to try and identify different single-celled anaerobic organisms uh, in soil samples. So far less exciting um, and far less relevant to the course. Now, in addition to including sort of my research background, my education background, I like to also include a little bit about me as a person. Um, this is especially important for online classes where you might not have the same kind of interaction with your instructor. So uh, you've already probably figured out, but I am obsessed with birds. I got uh, sort of very familiar with them, working hands-on with them at that rehab. I then ended up doing research with black-capped chickadees for many, many years. And now I actually have three birds at home. So I have three conures. You can see two of them in the image on the screen here. Um, you will occasionally hear them in the background, though I do try and record when they are either quiet or asleep. Um, but yes, every once in a while, they'll sort of chirp in the background. Um, I enjoy making art and I collect hobbies that are usually fairly creative. So I do things like sketching and painting. I also sew and cross stitch and crochet and knit and many, many other things. Uh, I am terrible at video games, but I absolutely love playing them, mainly older video games. Uh, my One of my favorites is actually Skyrim, which is quite a few years outdated. 
possibly at this point decades outdated, but uh, it's still one of my favorites to go back to. Um, I am obsessed with chocolate. I usually have some stashed somewhere on my desk for in-between lecture recordings. Um, and you'll notice fairly quickly that I tend to go off on a couple of tangents, and I try and keep those fairly closely related to course content or facts that tie into what we're talking about. But every once in a while, I will intentionally go off on tangents to provide some useful information which is actually my segue into the first of our tangents. And this is a discussion on how the heck do you address people in academia? And this is a topic that I really wish that I had learned about when I was an undergraduate. And it's one of those things that people in academia understand, but no one ever really explicitly explains it. So I include this tangent in all of my classes. But when you're trying to send an email to an academic, how do you decide how to address that email? The first of these is doctor. Um, so you've heard this already. I talked about me being Dr. Campbell. So this is just somebody who has a PhD, or if you're working in the medical field, someone who has an MD. So if you see that somebody's education includes a PhD or an MD, then you'd be safe calling them doctor their last name. Our next two are, instead of uh, degree titles, these are actually um, hired titles. So this is a position somebody has been given. The first is professor. This is someone, usually someone who also has a doctorate, who has been hired as a professor. So their job title is professor. And in that case, professor, their last name would also be appropriate. Not everyone who is hired to teach at university is, an, uh, is a professor, though. Some of us, myself included, are instructors. So you are still at the university. You may or may not have your doctorate, um, and you have been hired as an instructor. So for me, doctor is appropriate, instructor is appropriate, but I am not a professor. So Professor Campbell doesn't work. Not yet, anyways. Um, and I also find that instructor your last name, while it is uh, acceptable, I suppose, it seems kind of weird to me, which is why I go with Dr. Campbell or just my first name. Um, but if we wanted to figure out, well, okay, let's put this into practice. I always use my supervisor, Dr. Sturdy, as my example. So in this case, you can pull up somebody's web page. Um, if somebody's teaching at a university, there's almost always a find a person category, and it'll list everyone who's employed there. And it'll include information like this. So we can see with Dr. Sturdy, he has a PhD. He also has a master's and a bachelor degree. Um, and so we could call him Dr. Sturdy. We then see that he has been hired as a professor of science, so Professor Sturdy would work as well. Another little tip here, and this is again something I wish I had learned earlier, is that usually you're going to want to go very formal in your first contact. So if I was emailing Dr. Sturdy here, I would say, hello Dr. Sturdy, I read this cool thing and I wanted to ask you a question about it. Um, and then when you look at their response, you can look at their sign-off signature. So how do they sign their emails? And that's usually an indication of what they are comfortable with you using. So I have worked with Dr. Sturdy for long enough that I know that his response is going to be something fairly short, possibly not punctuated, and it's going to be signed Chris. Uh, and so in that case, I would say, all right, the next time I'm going to email him, I would probably be fine calling him Chris. So my next email would be, hey, Chris, thank you for your reply. Here's a follow-up question. Um, so it's one of those sort of cheat, cheat sheets on how to uh, properly interact with others in academia. All right, enough of a tangent. Oops. Next thing, and I guess sort of the last thing that I really want to talk about that's sort of self-serving, is to mention my teaching philosophy. And this is something that I really like including because if I explain to you why I teach the way that I teach or why I do things the way that I do them, it actually helps students sort of understand and figure out where I'm coming from with all of those different components. So my first point is that I think the material should be accessible. So you've probably noticed by now, I have possibly the most boring slides ever. Um, and that's because I've intentionally tried to find or tried to create very high contrast content. 
Um, I also try and include things like alternate text for images whenever I can. Um, I obviously do lecture recordings for my online courses, and when I teach in person, I still record all of those lectures. I like having that uh, sort of information available for students so that you can go back and rewatch everything. It's also really nice that when I post these on YouTube, they actually create transcripts for all of the videos, which means that if you wanted to have all the information that I've said and copy and paste that into your lecture notes, it's there for you in text format, which is awesome. Um, and I like to include flexibility as much as possible. You'll find that I try and give you information, things like, uh, say, chapter quizzes in advance, and then I try and give you lots of time to choose when you would like to complete those. So I try and integrate flexibility as much as possible. You'll also find that I try and get away from the traditional mindset that in order to succeed in a psychology class, you have to memorize a whole bunch of things. Um, I would much rather focus on teaching you to understand concepts, to think critically, to make connections between concepts. This is one of the reasons why I try and use open book assessments as much as possible. That way, you don't have to worry about memorizing a particular definition. Instead, you would have to understand and use the concept that would have been defined. So, so that's uh, sort of one of my biggest approaches. I'm trying to teach you to learn how to learn and to try and create the uh, notes and documents and things that are going to help you prepare that information in a way that's useful. I also think that that's a lot more applicable in the real world because it's very infrequent that you have to have lots and lots of definitions memorized. You're probably going to be able to look stuff up. We'll find very quickly as I run through the different components of the course that I like to use multiple sources of assessment. I have seen a lot of courses, especially in psychology, where you end up with two midterms and a final exam and that's it. And that kind of sucks if you're not great at taking multiple choice tests. So I like to include things like chapter quizzes and written assignments, things that are going to allow you to get marks in slightly different ways. And it also helps spread out where all of those marks are coming from, which means that if you do really poorly on, say, your first midterm of the semester, it's not an automatic uh, sort of tanking of your grades. You have that chance to make it up with multiple other sources. And the last point is, again, something you've probably figured out. I like to explain why. I don't just like to throw information at you and say this is the way it is. I like to tell you why something is. So why I teach the way that I teach, or why I go off on a tangent, or why I have explained my uh, education background. I find that information really useful, and honestly, it helps you remember that information better in the future. So you'll find a lot of why in this class. So for this class, to finally get into that, how can you do well in this class? Um, so I like to stress that you make use of the resources that are available. I'm going to show you our eClass page in just a few moments here, but I like to include lots of information. So I'm going to give you the slides and the recordings, but I will also on occasion uh, have extra links or extra videos to clarify or add to some of the concepts, especially if a bunch of students are finding that concept difficult. Um, for this coming to class is more of a attend the Zoom sessions, which are optional, and again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, come to those if you have questions or if you want to interact. It's going to be a chance for you to ask questions, to get me to go back over content if you have uh, sort of uncertainties. I can give you more examples or whatever. Um, so it allows you to ask questions and also interact with others and with your instructor. Talked about my extra videos and links, um, and don't hesitate to reach out. If you're not comfortable coming to one of the Zoom classes and you don't necessarily want to talk uh, in that format, you can send me an email. We can meet one-on-one. -on -one. I will be accessible to you. Um, I have already stressed that I focus on not so much the memorization, but on connecting concepts, and one of the best ways to prepare for that is by making detailed and organized notes, and especially to do that as you go, because those exams are going to creep up on you and you don't want to leave it to the last minute. 
Also, making those detailed and organized notes will help highlight any concepts that you're not really that certain of, which you can then bring to some of our meetings um, so you can ask those questions. Um, another thing, even though I use open book assessments, it doesn't mean that you can just sort of show up for the exams and hope to do well. I specifically design everything so that you should have a basic understanding of the concepts. You should know how they connect to one another. The notes are going to be there so that you can double check if you forget something, but you won't be able to look up every single thing on an exam. So definitely make sure that you study, prepare for these exams as if they weren't open book, um, and it should set you up to do much better on those tests. Um, and again, don't leave it to the last minute, especially when you don't have sort of daily classes to go and attend in person, it gets really easy to push stuff off until the last minute. So try and do things gradually, try and keep up as we go through our schedule, and that'll definitely help. So for our next bit of information, this is gonna get into this course in particular. We will go and take a look at our class website. Um, we have eClass. I also teach at other institutions where they use the exact same um, setup, the same program, I guess, but they all call it something slightly differently. Um, so the base content is actually called Moodle. Um, you might, or I might accidentally refer to it as Miscanus because that's what they use at McEwen. Um, but if ever I'm talking about the site, it's eClass. Um, and that's where you're going to be able to find our announcements, the syllabus. Um, I'll also have our slides and recordings and all of our assessment links and all of that useful information. So we'll hop over and look at that in a moment. A quick jump here to get over to our eClass page, which if you have found this video, then you've already found this website. However, I'm just going to do a quick scroll through so that you can see where all the important information is. Hopefully by now I've figured out how to label everything so it's easy to find and uh, clearly accessible and understandable. Um, but at the top here, I've just copy and pasted a bunch of stuff out of our syllabus, which we can go through that document as well momentarily. Um, the one thing I want to point out up here, uh, I guess two things regarding emails. One is I actually technically have two email addresses. Uh, this is my professional one, my full first and last name, but I also have the randomly generated one that comes from the university. And sometimes when students search by my name, um, they'll come up with ki6 at ualberta.ca. Both of those email addresses, the professional one and the auto-generated one, they both go to the same inbox, so it doesn't matter which one you use. I just prefer this one because it looks nicer. Um, and again, I just mention it because it has confused students in the past. Uh, the other thing is that when sending me an email, I encourage you to include the course name, code, and uh, section number, um, so Psych 105 and 800, um, simply because I'm teaching multiple sections of 105 and they all have slightly different methods of delivery, so I can better answer your questions tailored to the class that you're in if you also include that um, section number as well. All right, uh, for the office hours, this is our optional Zoom meetings. So like I think I have said already, um, I am going to be pre-recording our lecture videos. That's what today's video here is about getting you familiar with the classes, basically class number one. Um, but I'll be posting pre-recorded lectures, and then I'll be showing up in those Zoom meetings during our scheduled class time to give students a chance to ask questions about the content or to chat about uh, things related to the course or academia in general. Um, so those are going to be our equivalents of office hours um, or whatever we want them to be, depending on how many students show up and what they're interested in. And the way that I word this is that I will show up at the beginning of that period, so always at 2 p.m. I will stay around for at least 15 minutes. And the reason I include that is because sometimes nobody comes to these sessions. Um, and rather than having me sit there for an hour in an empty Zoom room, um, I just figured that after 15 minutes, if nobody has shown up, nobody's probably interested that day. 
However, if there are students present, I will absolutely stay longer than 15 minutes. I have planned to have that entire period that's scheduled for the class free for you guys. So if we have a bunch of people and we're having a good discussion or if we're going back over certain lecture content, um, I will keep going until we're finished. So um, that's why the wording is what it is there. And just as a note, the password to access those Zoom recordings is behavior with the Canadian spelling. Um, I don't know if it'll prompt you to use a password if you access it through eClass, but just in case I wanted to make it very clear. And one more thing about the Zoom stuff here, just reading through all the notes I've made. Um, so I record the Zoom meetings, not because I intend to share them or do anything with them, but just as a precaution and a protection, because sometimes when people are uh, interacting in online environments, interactions might not go as smoothly as we would like. So like I said, just a precaution, I'm not sharing them, uh, just to protect everyone involved. Um, so when you see that little recording button in the top corner, that's all that that that's for. All right, uh, so next up, this is our introduction to the course. So yours will actually have one more link in here, which is the link to this video. Um, so other than that, it'll just have the introduction slides that I use to give my initial presentation and then the link to get started with this video, which is going to walk you through everything you need to know to get started in the class. Um, I also reiterated our email policy, which is that include the whole course code title thing at the beginning. Um, I also encourage that when you're asking questions via email, try and keep them as specific as possible. Um, I've explained it more eloquently in the official policy, but it's basically saying, um, explain to me what you do understand about the concept and then what you don't quite get. And that way I don't explain stuff that you already understand and I can just focus in on what it is that you're unsure of. I started using this policy after getting a whole bunch of really broad questions, things like, I don't understand operant conditioning, which if you've taken 104, you might remember is a very, very broad topic that we cover for multiple hours in lecture, and definitely not something I could have covered in a single email. Um, but yeah, as much detail as possible is preferred for those. I am going to talk about uh, this achieve link in just a moment, but I want to go through the rest of our eClass stuff first and then come back to that so I can do everything all together all at once. Um, this is an online course, so everything is available online, including our examinations. So we'll be able to access both midterms and the final exam here in our examinations tab. Um, below that, I've actually broken down all of our lecture content into the different chapters, and I'll be populating each of these folders as we get to those specific topics in our schedule. So for this week, the first class today is intended to be um, sort of our introduction to the course, and then the next class, which will be Friday's class, is where we'll start uh, chapter two, our methods. Um, so I'll post a recording for that for that day. Um, if I I happen to have recordings done in advance, I will absolutely post them in advance, um, but at the very least you will have them posted for the day that we're intended to cover that content. So I'll try and stick to our schedule, um, but if I can get ahead, I feel like nobody would complain about having access to that information early. Um, and so you'll get our chapter slides as well as a link to the YouTube videos for each of those different topics. Um, so it'll be pretty straightforward once again, kind of like like what we had in our introduction thing here with the PDF or PowerPoint for the slides, whichever is your preference, and then a link to YouTube. Um, so all of those will eventually be the same. Um, at the bottom here, we have our research participation, and this is something that's unique to 104 and 105. So research participation makes up 10% of the grade in this class, and it is common to all introductory psychology courses. I do make a note here that this is run by uh, sort of a separate entity within the department. So Dr. Carlene Lynch is our research participation coordinator. That means that she is in charge of this system. She keeps everything running smoothly. She is our expert on this topic. Uh, and the reason why I stress this is because sometimes students have questions about research participation 
However, I actually have no experience with this site. Uh, I don't even have a login, so I can't access the site. I don't know how it works. All I know is what I had been told actually prior to COVID when they used to do in-class presentations. So I am a few years outdated in knowledge here. However, Carlene has done a fantastic job with this setup. So you'll notice there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of basics of here's stuff you need to know about. Here are dates and times that are important say that it starts on September 18th, um, so you don't have to rush to get started on research participation. Also that it will end on the last day of lectures, December 8th. Um, so you just want to keep an eye on some of those things. And then towards the bottom here, they actually have things like important notices, stuff that's bolded. And then this is the good stuff at the bottom here. They have frequently asked questions and also videos on how to actually access the site, on what you should be doing, and everything you need to know about uh, research participation. So I don't go into tons of detail on this. For me, it's just showing you that this is something that's accessible. Um, actually, at the bottom here is a link that will become visible to you. It's flagged as hidden right now. Um, it'll become visible to you when the participation system opens. So what I encourage you to do is read through and watch through all of this great information that Dr. Lynch has provided. And if you still have questions when you've finished it, then you can get in touch with her. All of her contact information is up at the top here. Um, and she's a fantastic person to interact with. Um, so don't ever hesitate to send her a nice email. Um, but yeah, that's my thing about research participation. And like I said, if you have questions about it, I probably can't answer them. And I will usually just point you towards her um, because again, I have no access to that system. Um, I also have, this is, I think I mentioned possibly, the extra resources, um, just some uh, font links and things that I found that are useful for um, accessibility things, especially with online classes. Sometimes reading a whole bunch of text on a computer screen or staring at a YouTube video recording for long periods of time is not uh, it's super fantastic for everyone. So things like being able to tint the color on your monitor can be really helpful. Um, but I'll add to that as I discover new resources that have helped me out. All right, one more hop here, and I've pulled up our syllabus, which you can also access on our eClass page. Um, most of this information is stuff that's already on eClass there. Uh, I just will point out, we don't currently have our TA assignments, so I don't have a TA name that I can provide for you. I have also been giving that caveat that um, while I don't have a TA, I have been a little bit slower to get back to emails than I had intended. So if you are awaiting a reply for an email from me. I am working through them as quickly as possible, and as soon as we have our TAs, I'll be having some help with some of that. Um, but I just wanted to be transparent with you guys about why it's still highlighted as to be determined um, and, and all of that. Um, but I'll keep you posted. Once we have a TA, I'll make a, a sort of an announcement and draw that attention. Um, so for the rest of this stuff with our syllabi, I would encourage that you read through a syllabus in its entirety at least once. Most of the syllabus structure um, actually comes from a template where they're going to have fairly similar resources and things like that. So towards the end of the syllabus where it's all of the contact information and links on where to find things, that's all fairly similar and I tend not to go through all of that. My encouragement is that you read at least once through all of that information, and once you're familiar with what's there, you can kind of skim it in the future. Um, but um, I'll get you to read through on your own things like, well, you've probably read the course description if you signed up for the class. Um, course prerequisites. This is an interesting one, and I'll do one of my little asides. Um, it used to be that you had to take 104 in order to take 105 in the department. But just over a year ago, they changed those requirements, and now you can take 105 without 104. And so in these situations, what I started doing is if there's content that was covered in 104 that would help facilitate the understanding of the 105 content, then I just recover that material. So especially where I start the, uh, the semester with chapter two, I've done that because understanding methods and carrying out research in psychology is fairly important to interpreting research in psychology. 
So I recovered that whole chapter um, because it's important for this, uh, this course. And I'll introduce little bits and pieces throughout whenever there are topics that would be beneficial for this class. That being said, it doesn't mean that if you haven't taken 104, you will be at a disadvantage. Because I've carried over any relevant information, you should be good to go whether you've taken 104 or not. Um, I just figured I'd let people know about that because I know some students took 104 before all the rules changed, uh, and it's still a fairly new change, so I just figured I'd comment on it. Um, all right, uh, we will talk a little bit more about the textbook that actually links to that Achieve site that I had mentioned when we were looking at our e-class. Um, this time around, this semester, I'm trying a new textbook. Um, so if you've taken a class with me before, I'm changing things up this semester. Um, and so I'm going with a required textbook this time around. And this is uh, the Shatter Psychology 6th Edition textbook. Um, and this textbook has a bunch of integrated online resources. You can also still get a physical copy of the textbook if you are not a digital textbook person. That was one of my sort of important factors was I still needed a physical textbook to be able to look at, because I know a lot of students don't love the online only approach. Um, in addition to that, they also have their online Achieve site. And what we're going to be doing is using what they've developed in order to try and facilitate learning different uh, components of the course. And we're going to be using that in the place of things like, uh, in the past I've used, say, chapter quizzes or chapter assignments. Um, and now they're running it all through their site. Um, and so we have our link to, they have a Google page that actually walks you through all of the information that you need and where you can go to get this textbook. Um, they also have, if you wanted to go just directly to our course site, once you have signed up for everything, um, this link will take you there directly instead of having to go through some uh, sort of hoops for this one. And then our course course ID, in case you need it while signing up, is just listed here as well. Um, and what I drop people's attention to is twofold. Um, so I know that not everybody loves having a required textbook. So we have two options for those who don't want to have to pay for a textbook. The first is that if you're on campus, they've actually set it up so that you can access all of the resources that come with the textbook for free if you are using it through the Cameron Library computers. Um, this was, again, one of those factors that actually had me consider using this textbook um, because I didn't want it to be strictly behind a paywall. So they have a free alternative if you're on campus. And if you are not on campus and do not want to pay, then I just encourage you to get in touch with me um, and we can discuss an alternative. Um, but there are op uh, options if uh, paying for the service is not something you want to do. Um, for the rest of the stuff, I kind of skim over online requirements for learning. That's the standard stuff. Make sure you have access to internet and computer and things like that. Um, we have our lecture schedule. So this is what I'm going to be trying to follow when I'm posting my content for the course. I will note that this is somewhat tentative. I might go a little bit over or a little bit under for any of these topics. So I'm looking at it and I had planned to finish chapter two this week, but knowing that my introduction video is almost always just about an hour, um, I know that we're not gonna cover all of chapter two in 50 minutes. So chapter two will end up bleeding into week two, but I already built in a bit of a buffer there as well. So we'll equalize out eventually, but you'll see very quickly that I post about as much as is needed to fill each of these theoretical lecture periods um, so that if you wanted to, you could keep watching them during the scheduled lecture times and stay on top of everything. Um, alternatively, you can watch them on your own schedule and then come to our Zoom les lessons um, just to chat about what you had watched, um, whatever works best for you. Um, we also have a couple of uh, holidays to work around because this is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday scheduled course. So we lose a couple of Mondays. Uh, October 2nd is our day in recognition of the National uh, Day for Truth and Reconciliation. I believe the official day is over the weekend, and so it's recognized on the Monday in lieu. Uh, we also have Thanksgiving Day, which is the next Monday, uh, and then we'll have Reading Week towards mid-November. So all of those are listed there so you can make note of those important dates. 
Um, other important dates that should be noted are the dates for, say, our midterms. Um, so here we actually have our breakdowns. So the midterms are each worth 25%. The final exam is 30%. Um, our research participation, like I mentioned, is 10%. And then that achieve component, uh, I tried to keep that as low as possible. So we have two uh, portions. You access them both through the same link, through the same site. They're all in the same place. And I'll show you that site momentarily. Um, one of which is our learning curves. So you're going to do a learning curve activity for each section of each textbook, or oh no, each section of each chapter. There we go. Um, and these are participation based. Basically, if you complete them, you're going to get those marks and they are 5% total. So each of these learning curves is worth less than 1%. They're intended to be very low participation based marks in order to get you to look at the content and think about the content as we go. One of the biggest problems with online classes is that if students uh, are not sort of sitting in a physical classroom and reminded to keep up with content, uh, it becomes very easy to fall behind. So these just encourage you to learn the content at a regular rate. Um, and like I said, they are uh, basically completion based. And as you work through them, they'll give you questions. And if you don't know the answer, they actually have a direct link to the part of the textbook where they talk about that topic. So you can click through, it'll highlight the section in the textbook that's relevant to that question. And then you can answer the question and move on. So it's designed to help you learn not only how to learn the content, but also it teaches you how to read a textbook and pick out information that's important. So a very, very good resource and one of the main reasons I went with this textbook. We also have some practice quizzes run through the same program, um, and these are going to be grade-based, but you have three attempts. And of those three, I will take the best of your three grades. And once again, worth 5% total. So you're gonna do one for each chapter, meaning that each one is worth less than 1% yet again. So these are not meant to be a massive component of your grade. They're just meant to keep you working through the content at a regular rate so nobody falls behind. Um, and again, I'll show you those momentarily when we hop over. I just know that if I leave this one document, I will forget to come back to finish it. Uh, but if we scroll down through here, we have sort of a more verbal description of those learning curves and practice quizzes. The dates for those are here. Those are going to be, once again, important. I will not be reminding you repeatedly about all of these dates, so I recommend sitting down on your first week and putting all these dates into your calendar. Make sure that you have all of these dates uh, together. Um, I will also note, I have one typo that I have found so far, which I didn't carry down that the final exam is worth 30%, not 35%. Um, I've caught a couple of little things in some of my syllabi. So if you've actually noticed any other inconsistencies, absolutely let me know. I hoped I got them all, but as per usual, stuff tends to slip by. And with me, it's especially numbers. Um, all right, the rest of this stuff should mainly just be predictable, repetitive with other classes. Um, the one thing I will make note of, if you have to miss a deadline, um, try and let me know in advance if at all possible. It is a lot easier to work with you in advance of a missed deadline as opposed to after the fact. I am aware that that's not always possible though. So if you have to miss a deadline or miss a uh, midterm, let me know as soon as you can. The one exception here is that if you have to miss a final exam, in those cases, that's not determined by an instructor. So if you have to miss a final exam, you'd have to apply to your faculty to request a deferral of that final examination. Um, and so in this case, they're actually going to get you to um, usually complete a form and explain why you had to miss it. Um, and it'll take them a couple of days to go through that approval process. So I just give students a heads up that that's what it is um, so that when you email me and I send you to your faculty, um, you're not surprised or disappointed or anything like that. Um, hopefully nobody needs to use this, but just in case, uh, this is where you can find all the details for that situation. Um, and again, this is why reading through this at least once is useful. And for the rest of this, I can leave this to you to skim through just to make sure you know where all of these resources are. 
And that brings us to the last of my jump cuts, which is the long promised, here is the course website through our textbook. So this is their achieve site. Um, and so I'm viewing it as a student, which I'm hoping means that I'm seeing it the way that you should see it when you log in. Um, so what we have here is basically it's gonna group by chapter. Um, so our first chapter is chapter two. We're gonna talk about methods. And like I said, there are uh, multiple sections in this chapter, and each section gets their own learning curve. So they end up being labeled pretty plainly, so hopefully they're nice and easy to follow through. And then as you work through these, you'll see that they're not weighted very much, um, and it'll show you your progress. So for example, I previewed our second chapter's uh, chapter quiz or practice quiz, and I never submitted it, so it's showing as in progress. Um, so you'll have access to that. Um, and then one more thing here are our surveys. Um, and it seems kind of weird to have surveys, but the reasoning behind these is actually very cool from a psychological perspective. And these surveys ask you questions about what are your intentions coming into this course? Or um, what methods of study are you planning to use? And they have a couple of check-ins throughout the semester, additional surveys that see, have you actually stuck with your goals? Have you tried new methods of study that might have come about because of the content that's provided with this uh, resource? Um, and how has it affected your performance? Um, and it, they typically find that when students are reminded that there are other ways to study, it actually tends to help you study better. Um, so it's kind of neat to see some of that data. So it's not just that we're collecting information, by prompting you to think about studying, it actually ends up making you study better anyways. So kind of a win-win. Um, I just figured I'd explain the logic behind those. Um, but yeah, the points that you care about are these practice quizzes and these learning curves, but I'd also encourage you to do the uh, surveys because they only take a few moments uh, and they're actually really useful as well. And that is everything. Um, I may have gone over stuff in more detail than you possibly wanted, or I might not have covered everything that you completely wanted. But if after watching through all of this and after reading through all of the information provided between our syllabus and our eClass site, if you still have questions, you are more than welcome to come to the Zoom lectures that are scheduled. Um, I, as I've said before, those are attendance optional. I am not tracking attendance. You don't get participation marks for showing up, but it is a fantastic resource if you are somebody who likes that interaction component. So I will be there. I will be answering questions. I know that on the first day, a lot of students haven't possibly had a chance to watch this video yet, so I'll probably go back over a bunch of these little details, but I will be showing up for all of those Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays at two o'clock. So if you have questions, come on by. And if you don't want to or can't make those times, definitely send me an email. And I just come back to that caveat that it might take me a day or so to get back to you, once again just because of the volume on our first days of classes. But I try and prioritize emergency situations, so if something has gone terribly wrong, I will do my best. Um, but for the most part, I'll, I'll give you all the details that you need from your emails as soon as I can. Uh, but with all of that out of the way, um, I hope this helped, and I will see some of you in our Zoom meetings uh, in the afternoon.